Yeah, welcome everyone to our race um, COE seminar today on the autoencoders. It will be a very brief introduction to autoencoders, uh, essentially two hours for a very, very interesting and also complex topic. So in this way, we basically need four or five university lectures to really um, understand that fully. But here we try to compress as much as we can the basics, uh, but also then some advanced elements that we have also in race already as part of the research in the different use cases. So let me just welcome you to this seminar, but also thinking about what we talk about today. Um, actually, after the welcome, I give a short role of the autoencoders in COE race, meaning that, of course, autoencoders can be used in many ways. Um, they are basically a very unique tool, which has a really interesting facets to it. And I will provide roughly 20 minutes talking about where actually autoencoders in, in COE race play a role. And also, of course, introduce a little bit of COE race for those here on the YouTube channel that maybe don't know uh, what race is. So there will be also some introductions briefly on use cases because we perform application co-design of the AI models and of the framework that we are developing. Then after that, um, it's again me. So we had the vacation time, so it was not really possible quickly to get speakers. But basically I provide you some university lectures on a short introduction on autoencoders, but also with hands-on. So we will have one code uh, actually executed on one of the deep systems that is also available to those that are part of RACE. Um, this is one system that we, of course, can use. And there will be an IPython notebook um, that you can basically use for that. And the interesting part then will be that this theoretical and more, let's say, basic autoencoder setup, so get everybody on the same page, really, will be then augmented this practice and experience from Rakesh, um, who is here with me on the call. And you will see it really his talk is going into deep details of variational autoencoders of how it relates to the use case um, or one use case we have here in our uh, race project. So there's really some details. And as I said, you should basically come out of the of this seminar then uh, with the idea basically for what autoencoders are and for some, let's say, specifics. I will focus more on convolutional autoencoders while Rakesh has also some insights to share about different varieties of those, including constraints, which is also an interesting new topic, very relevant for uh, race. Also, if you think about physics informed or physics constrained machine learning. At the end, I foresee something like a Q&A session, very flexible, where you can ask questions. And basically, then we can go from there. Now, just shortly, the speakers. So I mostly want to introduce um, Dr. Rak Sharma. He is basically in the Uli Supercomputing Center, one of our key experts in machine learning, but also with quite some knowledge in computational fluid dynamic applications. Um, actually, I just see that there's a wrong copy paste line. I immediately will remove that. Sorry for this. You're not anymore student. <laughs> so this is something which you already have achieved. So basically a postdoc here in our a field in the Uli Supercomputing Center. And shortly for my purse that don't know me, um, I'm actually a full professor at the University of Iceland teaching here high performance computing and parallel machine learning, but also have a research group in the Uli Supercomputing Center, having been there for 16 or I think now 17 years. In HPC, I'm also serving on the EuroHPC Joint Undertaking Governing Board member for Iceland which is also an interesting aspect because race COE is of course under the umbrella of the EuroHPC endeavors. So much for the speakers, um, just let me know uh, that basically let me shortly also say that this um, kind of seminar is also um, co-hosted by the EuroCC National Competence Center for HPC and AI in Iceland together with the race project. These national competence centers have been built in the EuroCC project, that some of you may know, and basically where we develop, at least here in Iceland, um, the simulation and data lab strategy in a very close collaboration with Jülich, because also Jülich, of course, has performed these, uh, basically created and uh, have been, you know, successfully implementing this model of simulation and data labs now for over, I think, at least 15 years. So hence, we in Iceland um, have a very strong uh, 
collaboration with Jülich, showing also here the race project, but also uh, above this with many different PhD students going back and forth between the center and then the university. I should also mention that we basically embrace this modular supercomputing model. I talk about this a little bit more when I come to back to race, but this was developed in the deep project. And basically, if you see the infrastructure of Exascale growing in the Yuli arena, you see there's one of Europe's number one system, of course, right now, but also hopefully in the future, it will be based on a modular supercomputing design. And some more information is also available on YouTube if you want. We're also part of Lumi. I should just mention that because it has also a very modular structure in the system architecture, where Iceland is also part of the, um, let's say, consortium that spans different country, whereby physically the Lumi system will be located in Finland. Right, and that's all I wanted to leave on the table here for the welcome, the speakers, the agenda. Um, as I said, it will be more brief introduction of this topic. So let's go with the next talk and thinking a little bit about race itself and then the role of autoencoders. So again, the autoencoders are of course very, very broad subject. So um, let's go and dive into this later on. But first of all, of course, we have to understand a bit what race is doing for those that are looking at this video here on the YouTube channel or basically that have been now coming from the outside. Um, we have the RACE website, first of all, uh, where you can get all the information about the research we're doing, the frameworks we want to create and build, and also the use cases that basically give rise to it. Then the key motivation and approach is that there are a lot of simulation sciences, um, basically um, simulations based on you know, known physical laws using numerical methods and so forth. And basically they generate a lot of data and also there we think about that AI technologies have a role to play. And of course, particularly RACE looks at this towards the exascale arena. So we are very interested in AI technologies that are really scaling. So using, let's say many different GPUs in parallel to really train an IA algorithm and not just let's say using your local Anaconda setup uh, on the laptop to really do AI. So here we're talking about using high performance computing resources, many GPUs, uh, or basically then intertwined, basically also with CPUs, maybe in simulations. It depends, of course, what approach you're doing. This is uh, encoded in our different nine use cases. Sometimes we do surrogate modeling. Sometimes we do basically autoencoders to enrich the data. Um, these are, of course, elements which have to be designed based on the different use cases. And these use cases in RACE are actually two folds. We have firstly the computer-driven use cases you see here. Lots of them are out of the fluid dynamics, uh, let's say regime or engineering at large. Uh, you see engine design, um, basically reactive flows, but turbulent flows also. And on the other hand, we have the data-driven use cases with fundamental physics from the Large Hadron Collider from CERN, but also to seismic imaging uh, combined with remote sensing, manufacturing, and also acoustics. So it's a broad variety of use cases that in one form or the other have either physics that governing, of course, the use case in the first part, and then of course, in the data-driven use cases part, rather those are driven by the data generation. And both are basically put here in race as the co-design applications. And you can imagine that all of them have a different modus operandi of using models, which is this interesting symbol here that you see on the one hand, and then also generating data on the other. So of course, in a way, there's some similarity and what we basically work on right now is to really carve out these different uh, similarities and really understanding the requirements for AI at Exascale much better. Um, and for this, we have basically started different processes. And when you look at the RACE project, we basically trying to support this not only with AI modeling, but also of course with scaling up uh, deep learning code. Some of you have been part of the last seminar, which was actually distributed deep learning, meaning we have been showing Horovod examples of PyTorch scaling up and also some lessons learned on deep speed. And of course, the modeling is an important part, like today, introducing a little bit the outer encoders. But then there are also data augmentation approaches if you don't swim in data. And in fact, auto encoders in one way can be also used for the shortage of data. I come to that later on. And of course, then benchmarking HPC machines 
uh, using pre-trained AI algorithms is another area where we're working in. And in fact, also autoencoders again can be used for this, and especially for transfer learning. I will come to this later also and explaining it. And you know, basically one of the largest challenges that you have, let's say where HPC can make a difference for Exascale is really then the architecture search methods, uh, which is let's say auto auto ML techniques or semi-automatic ways of finding the best hyperparameters to your IR models, which is of course, if you want the, the most challenging aspects in most of the AI applications. So this is really intertwined and the goal of RACE is then um, after the three years having a really good um, understanding of a unique AI framework that really works, scales, and basically was co-designed um, by this computing and data-driven use cases, but of course also leverages hardware infrastructure and software infrastructure that we have available and that we basically proved um, useful for exascale. And this would be well embedded, of course, in open source community, AI best practices, uh, the, let's say, more political field of your HPC and praise, as well as the national competence centers. So this is the key goal of RACE. Um, and here, of course, we have to understand first what all the different use cases are doing. So we embarked on a journey of creating so-called fact sheets to get a rough understanding um, of what basically are the key components of all the different use cases. Uh, what is basically achieved and what software libraries are used. But then we over time also developed more understanding of these fact sheets and basically needed a methodology for really continuous interaction across the AI experts and the physical experts. So in this sense, you see that these fact sheets very nicely clarify the layers of different, let's say computing resources used. Here's an example of my own research from remote sensing as you know, what, what we have published once using a quantum anila on the one hand side, but also then using traditional machine learning on basically A100s on the other side on joules on the HPC system. So it shows you a little bit the overview and it was very good for us already to carve out and understand that many people have very similar requirements when it comes to the packages, to the frameworks. Now, when you look now all through this um, and go through all the different fact sheets, which are still work in progress in our project, you came up to a metrics and something what we did also in the beginning of the project to think about what are those different um, AI methods we really need for all the different use cases. And you see here a matrix, which is basically developed very early on in the project, essentially while we submit the project to the commission, you see the auto encoder role was not so broad yet, potentially also because not everybody was really knowing what auto encoder are doing. And this is something what, of course, this seminar today should also help with, so that potentially also more use cases will benefit from auto encoders. Maybe not for the modeling, it can be also used, as I said, as pre training of some sort, or basically as data enrichment, denoising data. I will come to that in my talk about the basic auto encoders. But then, really, is since then following is this um, HPC systems engineering of all the different use cases with AI methods, we have a so-called moral board uh, in, a, in a methodology really from software engineering, we um, actually imply, employ here in the project called interaction rooms. And also some of you may have been part of this, but if you want, please go to the YouTube channel. Um, also for those that don't like it or don't follow it yet, I encourage you to follow the YouTube channel. I think it's good also for us to have more followers. And of course, this is one methodology that should really come out of the CEO Race project. And it, I'm also um, quite glad to share that the Admire project under the EuroHPC umbrella has now started to implement that outcome of Race. So they do a similar setup now with Interaction Room and starting this as we have done and shown here for Race. So this is already one part of our strategy, of course, of saying what we do outside the Race project, how we connect to the community. Coming now more concrete to the role of auto encoders, you may ask, is that we had, of course, these mural boards now um, essentially uh, done for all the different nine use cases. And you see, we have a problem canvas. We see most more or less scientific problem behind it. Then the data canvas showing, you know, what data is available, what can be used for training, testing, and potentially validation data. And in the model canvas, we focused mostly on the AI models. So from LSTM methods, convolutional networks, 
Also, autoencoders was basically mentioned here and there as a potential model. Hence, we have a seminar today to use it. We focus here today on PyTorch because more and more we find that when we talk about exascale and scalability, that PyTorch seemed to be better scaling, especially when you think a multi GPU setup. So this is something what I put here in the room. And of course, please here in the community prove us wrong. We also use Horovod um, several times for up to 125 GPUs uh, on, on cutting edge HPC resources in my own research. But recent studies from Ray show um, that we can also prove and show, of course, in, in another seminar uh, that PyTorch basically is perhaps better scaling. So we concentrated this a little bit also thinking about our software framework we're going to do. But what can you now do with autoencoders? So that's, of course, now one of the key questions, right? So um, as I said, it's a very broad range of tools. In a way, we should have much more time to bring this across. But the, the general approach, if you want, from the architecture style is basically given here. The model has always one form like this. So you would have an input part that people would say is the input data and it, you fill it into the encoder part. You have this interesting latent space Z where we talk about also sometimes called latent code. And then you have the output here, which is the decoder um, where you basically reconstruct something what you learn from the latent space. So in a way, um, the general idea is to reconstruct the input and then you immediately would say, well, that's not very fun. Uh, well, where is the use in this, right? So, but we will come to some interesting use cases uh, in the next hour when we have the seminar here. And just think about that this is the basic structure of an autoencoder. There are very different variants um, in basically in practice. Um, I will talk a bit about convolutional autoencoders. They're relatively good to understand for students, for those that are not really deep into autoencoders yet, having a convolutional part, maybe of an image. Um, basically derived from convolutional networks and then also having a deconvolution part, which is not nothing else than basically a transposed convolution in the decoder part. And of course, these terms doesn't mean anything to you. We see well that materialized when I will talk a bit more about the autoencoder basics. I'm also very uh, glad to have here Rakesh with me talking in the seminar because he really shows details of variational autoencoders um, they are quite complicated material. Um, it's not directly so obvious than, let's say, a traditional neural network with backpropagation and just, you know, input data in and it goes through a couple of neurons and then basically having a softmax in the end and then some classes. So you see, it is basically some complicated material, but also very rewarding and has good use cases in practice. So <clears throat> one example application uh, area, which is in race is remote sensing is one of the data driven use cases where you can use, for instance, um, the idea of these um, basically convolutional uh, autoencoders for image compression, right? So in a sense, you have in remote sensing, often these cubes, you have multidimensional data sets. So you don't have the cover of the earth from a satellite, which means remote sensing. You really reach with different spectral channels really into the earth, uh, basically also understanding what material it is. And these hyperspectral images um, can be nicely then used with autoencoders to basically have a really representation or a very condensed representation in this Latin space of these images, which is a little bit alluded to here. And if you see it recompiles a bit what you see in the basic structure, you see the original input where the multispectral data set and then you have a very, let's say, in this bottleneck, as it is all sometimes called here in the Latin space, a very compressed representation. And then you try to reconstruct basically out of this the image again. And this can have different use cases, of course. Here's a publication where you see some examples on that, um, basically in remote sensing. Now, when you think about the um, the potential use of autoencoders and in all the other different use cases. Um, this is, of course, um, very broad. So we could talk about that um, not always labeled data is really available, labeled in the sense of really knowing maybe from a classification perspective or labeled data that we know there's some physical event happening. So essentially what autoencoders are quite good in is to work with unlabeled data, something we called also sometimes unsupervised 
um, learning or semi-supervised learning and come to later. And then basically it is useful of course for us in race because sometimes creating data to learn from machine learning can be extremely expensive. So if you have large eddy simulations or direct numerical simulations, DNS uh, of a very large space, this needs a lot of HPC time, right? Let's say wind wheels that we have in the project, wind farms would be essentially unthinkable. So here, basically there, we can also think about creating data um, which is less computation expensive because we essentially could use the autoencoders, maybe even as generative models, but also then, um, you know, working quite good for pre-training and so forth. So in a way, it's really useful to use them when there's rare ground truths, hence unsupervised learning. The way when I talk about semi-supervised training, it becomes very popular these days uh, in the combination of really using it, let's say, um, for for data set, which is, let's say, relatively rare and labeled data. Yeah, if you take remote sensing again, you have a big area and maybe just a, a, a few couple of patches have been, you know, really annotated and labeled that this is a tree, that is a water, that is, you know, that takes usually this labeling process a lot of time. So people have to invest a lot of time for this. And then as a consequence is usually very rare and not maybe covering your whole interest space. So in this sense, what you could do is you just take essentially the unlabeled data and using these autoencoders, training them, uh, let's say pre-train them. Um, for instance, as I said, we see convolution autoencoder that we will look at and then basically cut off some parts of the autoencoder we will talk about and then reusing the, let's say, trained in an unsupervised fashion way to perform something we call transfer learning. So you adopt the trained basically weights of the first part of the network and you dock it to a let's say more classical regime if you want of softmax and classes and then basically do the, the rest of the training really in a normal supervised setup with those data where you have enough labeled samples from and this already have let's say big impacts today because then the weights are already let's say, um, prepared for the learning task at hand. So you're not having a cold start with this little bit of labeled data, which might be not enough to really um, actually then try the try and get a very good model. And basically, this um, is one idea how we can use it in the project here and there. Um, there are other ways. For instance, if you think about data cleaning tasks um, or production, when I think about we have also 3D printing and manufacturing use case where actually auto encoders are very useful for denoising data, but also identifying very quickly outliers and anomalies. And I will talk about it, meaning that if there's a image maybe of a, let's say, high resolution image of a very, let's say, uh, image processing of some 3D printing ongoing, then uh, we see some anomalies and outliers. Um, and this is of course part of the research, uh, probably by using autoencoders and using some thresholds in, in the validation loss and so on that you can steer. So you see it, different use cases in a sense. So using it for semi-supervised training because we combine unsupervised with supervised, that's what it called CP supervised, or we're using it for outlier anomaly detection we see more use cases with constraints and the variational autoencoders than in physics, um, actually, when then Rakesh is talking. And I think this is already a little bit showing you that all the different use cases can make use of this autoencoders uh, in a different way. And we probably will also inform you in, in another seminar, perhaps more towards the end of the project or in the second half, really, how we adopted these autoencoders then in practice in race. Right, so that's for the idea of the role in race, so why we have autoencoders. And um, I maybe take the chance shortly to give a short round of questions. I think we are relatively good at the time while I'm preparing you something. So if someone has a question here on the call, feel free to shoot. shoot. Maybe me or Rakesh, we can maybe answer it. once everybody shy tomorrow at uh, this morning or basically not really awake yet okay going once twice i also see the, nothing in the chat 
Okay, yeah, then in the light and the time, let's continue a little bit. Um, this will be now uh, basically a presentation from university lecture material. But the good news is I will also share with you some ways how you can quickly use an iP uh, a Jupyter notebook really online on deep. So here and there I switch from the slides back to the Jupyter notebooks in Jülich. And then we can have, let's say, a bit more interactive session than just plain talk from university material slides. They are very much on an introductionary level. So of course, both of you are really deeply working with autoencoders. Um, there's not much to gain from it, apart maybe how to access it and work with it in deep in the HPC infrastructure. So yeah, basically, um, welcome again now to the autoencoders a short introduction and an overview. So we will have essentially um, this kind of outline. Uh, we will start with some foundations which are really necessary for autoencoders. Um, we have to talk a little bit about supervised learning versus unsupervised learning, maybe also bringing back the idea of this learning building blocks that we had already in one of the seminars before, just to clarify terminology and where HPC can really make a difference. Um, we have PyTorch as one of the packages, and I would like just to briefly show you how you can quickly can use it for Jupyter JSC, essentially to reproduce what we will do here in this simple tutorial, at least in the first part. And for this, we picked the MNIST dataset um, for the AI people of you. You know that is always a 101 in AI uh, in terms of data sets to understand. So we will look a little bit on this image um, recognition task, and then also the thinking about the digits. Um, in a way, what needed to be first oops, was basically convolutional networks. So, but this is material where you essentially start from perceptrons, multi-layer perceptrons, artificial neural networks with backward propagation up to convolutional neural networks to really understand it. So essentially I'm saying, again, material of four university lectures, and we cannot do this time-wise here in these two hours. We concentrate on autoencoders but of course, um, to really understand the autoencoder structures, especially in this part of the training with encoder, decoder, convolutions, deconvolutions, it would make sense also to learn more on convolutional networks, in particular, the convolutional process, uh, the sampling, the pooling layers, and, and so on. But of course, um, yes, in, in short, we cannot do this. However, I brought you an illustrative example that we can briefly look at in order to roughly understand what the convolution essentially entails um, and also the pooling and, and so on. And then we will dive into autoencoders. We will look a little bit on the encoder decoder architecture I already was alluding to, but then of course in much more detail, we want to understand a little bit this latent space, which is in the rent there also called latent code, which is essentially a very uh, compressed representation of the input. Um, trying of course to have um, lots of information condensed and then to use it for some form of reconstruction, reconstruction process. And for this to demonstrate, we use the convolutional autoencoder example here with this MNIST data set that we basically look at in the beginning. And of course, we then also at the end, will look a little bit on different application use cases I was already alluding to, pre-training, denoising, and things like that. So references are all in context. I encourage you to look at them. I want to highlight two, basically, which is one interesting YouTube video I would recommend that you see referenced many times. But also then there's a very nice uh, Jupyter notebook that we actually will take up and will use on JSC infrastructure uh, that was prepared um, by a very nice tutorial also on autoencoders, just saying that this material I use here for teaching in university and at this part of the seminar was basically also derived from many different sources already and not completely new. Okay, so fasten your seatbelt for some foundations. That is, of course, important. Uh, machine learning at large, we know already, um, and this is, of course, a little bit true for autoencoders, um, there needs to be some pattern that exists in the data. So if you work with this and you don't have a pattern um, or you have rubbish data, let's say people say rubbish in, rubbish out, you could say very blurry blurry images from data sets which seem to have no really pattern at all you can see hand number handwritten uh, digits maybe written in a very extraordinary way and stupid way 
this is rubbish in, rubbish out. So randomness is not good in this sense. So auto, also autoencoders will fail. I can tell you that already. But of course, largely machine learning is not made for that. So you have to have as a prerequisite, usually a pattern exists. In our use cases will be the MNIST data set. So we want to recognize these digits apparently out of images um, that are handwritten. On the other hand, uh, machine learning also deals with number two very much. There is not really a mathematical formula that now says exactly, okay, you take these part of the pictures and this is a physics formula and it must be always a seven, it must be always a six and this is always a zero. So if that would exist, you just go ahead and implement this function, right? If there's a mathematical formula, there's no need to learn to do all the epochs, to do all the iterations. And then finally, I think that goes without saying, the data need to be existing. Um, we're learning from data. This is something what we call machine learning. So in this sense here, it's very important that data exists, but also of course the data needs to be in a very, let's say good um, quality to really make good, let's say results happening. In a way you see that's data science at large these days, um, something what is you know a combination maybe of data mining, machine learning, applied statistics, and what it adds to this field largely with this term often is this big computing factor. So we see now in data science, large deep learning networks, which really require a lot of computing resources, but also large autoencoders, depending on how many neurons you really put in the different layers um, can be very computationally expensive. So, and I think we will talk about it throughout our lecture today. Now, when you think about learning approaches, this is a bit important here today. Um, because majority of the um, machine learning, if not maybe 80%, if you want to have a gut feeling, is supervised learning. So that means, as you see in the flowers, someone already has you know, done basically an interesting job of having here two classes already annotated or labeled. So we know that flowers from Iris Cetosa look like this and Iris Virginica look like this. And when I come with a new flower, a new unseen data set, I have trained a system based on this supervised input. So basically on these existing classes. And then I can actually have a classifier that tells me, oh, that looks like a Cetosa or like a Virginica. We call that supervised learning because for every input image you would have, you have already the class represented, the Iris Cetosa or the Iris Virginica. And then of course, for new images, there is no class. You want to identify the class, but this is often very good um, possible with supervised learning approaches. Another example is, of course, credit card approval based on previous customer applications when they basically have already the default of those you know, previous customer applications or those that actually strive and have a good credit card you know, balance. Um, you can use this historical data set, which is, so to speak, labeled with this kind of um, failing or winning, so to speak, and then can use it for supervised learning. Now, why we talk about this today is because autoencoders are actually in the field of unsupervised learning, not alone. As I said, there's a semi-supervised um, hybrid, if you want to use it then also partly uh, or reusing it to be more accurate in, in kind of supervised learning, make it then semi-supervised. But unsupervised learning is usually something where um, you don't have really these classes existing. However, it's not that bad, you would see that there's something in the data that has some, let's say, uh, representation to be come out or to basically to learn from. And uh, of course, this is exactly what the autoencoder will do, right? It will try to get into this Latin space, all the information compressed, what has, let's say, a higher level data representations. And there are many of those unsupervised learning approaches around famous um, algorithms in that area are also clustering. That's why at the end of this, uh, slide set, we also will see clusters again, which actually have a role to play also in the validation of the autoencoders here and there. Other examples are here from research in our groups. Uh, you see essentially here a brain image, which was basically cut in different slices. And um, you see the cell distribution suggests different, let's say, uh, different uh, yeah, densities really in the brain which actually then stand for different cortical layers. So having then a different, let's say, functionality of the brain. And our clustering algorithms are basically in a way able now to, to look at this and get a feeling for this kind of density by using, uh, you know, basically similarity measures like the Euclidean distance and so forth, 
to identify the different clusters, which in a way can be then merged to get to some good results that we see here, for instance, to identify in these brain scans and the different cortical layers. But you have this always a very trivial example, often the coin recognition in the vending machines, which are weight, basically have a similar idea with weight and size of the coins and so forth. We will talk about unsupervised learning and autoencoders throughout the lecture. So basically, this is something what we will pick up just for the sake of completeness. Uh, reinforcement learning is now a little bit where there's a pain and gain signal, like a human way of learning. Basically, you go iteratively to a task. Here, one very famous machine learning example is always a toddler that basically looks at a you know, coffee cup and or tea cup and see there's smoke coming out and it the toddler, like the human, would always touch it. And basically, over time, hopefully, we'll learn that don't touch hot cups of coffee, uh, only then when basically the smoke has stopped coming out. So in a way, try and error style, um, having this reinforcement learning, this so-called agents being in some form of the environment, and really learning then over these kind of pain and gain strategy. But this is something what we don't talk about today. Today, we want to talk about unsupervised learning. So again, contrasting this and thinking about the, the terminologies and where supervised and unsupervised is now, uh, basically the difference should be this diagram. First of all, you have all the different components essentially that you have in a supervised scenario here now existing. You would say that we have some function that we never know we want to achieve and you know try to do and learn something like this pattern we talked about, but we don't really know and we can't know. We just assume it will be derived from the same probability distribution, P on X, that is basically giving rise to the data, having here this kind of vector X with all the different features that you would have in the data set. Now, making it to the training examples means historical records, ground through data, examples, samples, whatever you have. And the supervised setting has always this governing Y, right? While, of course, the data was created in one way, someone was labeling that for us. So in the remote sensing, that would mean one pixel is water, one pixel is you know, a tree, one pixel is a tram. So whatever it is, essentially what the classes represent. But this is some form of a class identity. And exactly this is missing in the unsupervised setup, right? So in the supervised setup, you would have this governing Y, a label, ground truth. And in the unsupervised, this is missing. However, what you would still have in the unsupervised way and in the supervised fashion, of course, is a learning algorithm. So you would always pick now this out of your pocket where you know now you have to think about what is the learning algorithm and what is the hypothesis. So examples are um, hypothesis like a support vector machine. You go to quadratic programming as a learning algorithm. Or if you go to neural network, you have, of course, the backpropagation of error, which make the neural network successful basically going one through the network and then in the back pass propagate the error back to do the weight updates, to, to do the gradient updates. So of course this needs to be governed by something to learn that's getting that I'm getting better. And you know, this is of course something where the error measure comes into the game. Also today in the autoencoder world, we will have some error measure, um, which is a quite famous one, but also can be adjusted to the given problem at hand. And through iterative learning with this algorithm, and then trying different hypothesis sets, maybe don't get stuck in a neural network with two hidden layers, maybe three hidden layers, move on to convolution neural layers. These are all different hypothesis sets that need to be used if you want to train. And of course, the autoencoders would be now one of those hypothesis set elements and models that you really want to use to train, and then hopefully get this final hypothesis in a way right, which means here you would think about that Something was creating, of course, our data um, in terms of an image, for example, which is the input data. And we hope that we can reconstruct something we basically create out of the decoder part that hopefully approximates as best as possible the F, the unknown, basically, um, yeah, that gave rise to the, to the image at hand. This is, of course, a very abstract way. And just to also shed light of the points where exascale can really matter. Right, so of course, in terms of storage, you would think training examples. We have more and more big data. Uh, that you will see that the simulation data coming out of some DNS or large eddy uh, is definitively worse to consider. But also, of course, the computational parts in the HPC towards exascale uh, 
are very much loaded when you think about ResNet uh, residual networks um, that have many, many different, you know, deep layers to train with billions of parameters. So there you really can benefit from HPC and that's where RACE is a bit focusing on. Good, so coming a little bit to the hands-on part, thinking about what system to use. Um, here in RACE, we have the deep system as one of the prototypes of modular supercomputing, which is not the production system jewels, uh, basically that is existing. But here we have, let's say a system where we can you know, do smaller tests and explore what the modular supercomputing architecture really can do. Uh, it has essentially four core parts just shortly was developed in the deep series of projects, uh, mostly having a data analytics module part, an extreme scale booster really with lots of accelerators, but relatively, let's say normal performance CPUs. And then the typical number cruncher, basically the cluster module. Um, in, in this form, you basically are ready for many different applications using this modular approach. And of course the storage is something uh, which is in the moment, of course, parallel file systems partly um, and then, of course, some innovations that we had in the deep project, like the network attached memory, which is not yet on the market or, or other things. And the vision that this drives is that you need basically different parts of the module at different uh, times. You would say that some of the work we do with a quantum manila is quite interesting just for the optimization of the machine learning part. So the inherent learning of a machine learning algorithm and the rest of the handling with the data can be actually done with the data analytics module. Uh, linking to the extreme scale storage. So combining those module where the data analytics module would have also some GPUs uh, with this interesting new innovative models is their one key goal, um, thinking about the future also when we maybe have even neuromorphic devices. Now the Jupyter tool, I'm, I'm sure everybody of you know in one way or another, um, I guess I just quickly just tell that this is of course a very easy, nice interactive way of doing um, you know, Python scripts um, based on machine learning libraries like TensorFlow, Py, uh, Torch, and so forth. So this is often used, incredibly often, especially in the AI domain. And you can have this also in cloud computing platforms today. So AWS, MS Azure, they all provide this. There's a very famous Google Collab where you get a free GPU, so to speak. Also, if you want to test what we do today, um, and of course, we have also a Jupyter tool available on our Uli Supercomputing Center systems. So I just demonstrate that a bit um, where, of course, you need to have an account for that. So people in within race um, can have here an account that's for sure. But of course, also um, those outside, if you have interest, please contact us. There's a possibility for some reason, the, the Dumb was not starting here. Okay, so let's see. Sometimes maybe the systems are basically out of, uh, not really working, um, but we can make a trick and maybe use in the CPU because, so I was trying to get a GPU. Maybe it's already that many people are using all the GPUs and it's not, oops, sorry, uh, Jupyter JC. So, then we can do something else. So you see here, essentially, I maybe should look out quickly to, to demonstrate this. Look out, stop all running, yes, look out. So when you go to this web page, you see on Yuli here, this interesting, nice uh, Jupyter notebook. And I think it was also part of one of the seminars in the past um, in co-organization with another COE, if I remember correctly. So also there are resources how to learn about this more in detail. If you have an account, you can log in, create your own Jupyter lab. And here, of course, we switch to the deep system. Um, usually I would say I would go to the deepest dumb and then pick a GPU. But here I will stay now on the login node, usually not recommended, um, but here now for the sake of testing, um, because it failed to log into the GPU nodes, we basically try this login node. Of course, needless to say, there will be no GPU, so we will see that the training is relatively slow, but at least we see that the script is basically working. And as I said, the script is also available openly. If you want, um, then you basically can use it and test it on your own system. 
And I try to get in sync with, you know, the slides all the time. So when I demonstrate something, usually an equal description of some thought should be also on the slides. So to let that you know that not everything is basically just interactive. But if you now come to our um, yeah, environment here, you see essentially um, these Jupyter notebook environment. Um, you see here already a one launcher. That is not so important. Different applications really you can pick. The Pi Deep Learning environment is quite nice. But the, the interesting thing is no the question where you go, you always have to make sure um, if the tools that you want to use are really existing, right? And in our case, we said a little bit in the motivation for the seminar, we want to use PyTorch. So there should be something like import torch available, or if you want to use this endless data set, which is nicely provided in the torch vision and some some tools there to really transform images and so on. Of course, this should be available. So something like this, you need to test. And, and if it's not available, it's sometimes not hurting very much because there's a chance of using perhaps an SSH. Here you see, we can use simply the, the terminal, for instance, of going basically 10 to the deep system. Again, remember we're now in the login node. Um, usually it should be somewhere on the compute node where also some, let's say, constraints apply when you think about downloading data sets and so forth. So that's something where I say careful in machine learning. And yeah, I can elaborate on this later on. So what you could do here is really pip install, make sure you basically have it as a user space and then check if Torch is installed. Of course, usually you would go the way of saying you're somewhere in your iPod's notebook, would import Torch uh, and, and so forth, and then see if it works or not. But here you see um, a little bit cheating because I, of course, already have installed it here. Um, you see the requirements are already satisfied. So Torch is apparently already available. So our import should be you know, successful. Just for the other side, if you know you don't have this installed yet, you will see essentially here that this uh, pip install is able to give you the access to this framework, uh, installing it, downloading it, and also having, let's say, the, the collaterals or other packages also installed if necessary. You see this nicely in the Torch vision, which is another one that basically is also there uh, nicely installable with pip install. Of course, this is something how how you could work with PyTorch. Of course, you could do similar things with TensorFlow and then maybe adding Horovod. But of course, this is um, depending on, on the idea of work you really have to do and want to do. See some smaller imports here, SkyKit Learn, which is already provided basically as part of the um, environment that you have here available. So this is something we don't have to install. For the different imports we're going to use, as part of the prepared notebook in this environment is basically this one. As I said, this was obtained from a tutorial here, if you're interested, from this lady, Eugenia Anello. So this works nicely on our systems as well. It takes some time to, to basically warm up. But um, yeah, here you see essentially also in our installation, it seems that everything is satisfied. And we can do, of course, the same for the vision package and see if that's really satisfied. And we see also here the requirements are satisfied. Otherwise, it would be installed and gives you all the opportunity to reproduce the results or to reproduce what we have here in this IPython notebook. Just close that. Now, coming to this um, notebook, um, basically, you see here the whole story um, of the tutorial. So what I always recommend usually is to restart the kernel and clear all the outputs. Uh, in this particular case, um, of course, also because we want to test if Torch and Torch Vision now is available. So I do here just a simple shift enter and you see the asterisk here or the star means it is computing and waiting now and preparing the environment of PyTorch. While at that time we shortly can maybe talk about the other packages here. Um, that I there the data load is nicely when you have the testing and training data sets, also splitting them in so called validation data sets for model selection. So, there are good tools in this torch.utils.data around this. Um, everything related to neural networks when it comes to um, pooling layers, to activation functions, to paddings, to um, nonlinear activations, 
um, on, and containers really, if you think about sequentials in, in PyTorch, this is part of this particular part in, in Torch and essentially the optimizers is of course then the real machine learning essentially based or backed up on optimizations, things you probably already know like SGD or also in more modern ones like Adam. So in a sense, you import, of course, what you need. This is a knit very specific to AI. That's a general principle. And that's basically part here what we do. Let us just check what the Jupyter Notebook says. So here you see it has a one now. That means it was properly executed. And all of these different modules are now available. If you have errors here, it makes no sense to continue, right? You have to fix usually those errors here to continue to have the whole notebook uh, basically properly executed. So while this is working, let's look a little bit on the data set we're going to look in to understand the autoencoder. So um, I said already, it's this handwritten character recognition MNIST data set. If I would make a poll in a physical class, I think very much the chances that many students already know it. So it has 60,000 training samples, 10,000 test samples, which helps us in a way you understand now it's a supervised learning setup. And we have 10 class classification problems, 10 class meaning zero till nine of this handwritten digits, which are there. And the beauty is here that basically each of these images, which are 28 by 28 pixels, grayscale really, has an associated label with it. So basically you see it's a, it's a matrix X, if you want, from this 28 by 28 pixels. And there's always a governing Y that says it's a zero, it's a two, it's a four, it's a seven. So this is, of course, a very, let's say, optimized setup, right? And we will use the auto encoders also in a more, let's say, um, unsupervised way. We don't need to use a label. But of course, here, the, the beauty of this data set, that's why it became it a benchmark or a tutorial data set of sort, is something, of course, which is a supervised ideal scenario. Another view of this is essentially shown here. When you see um, here is a five and you have this label, right? You have 28 by 28 pixels. You have the gray scale intensity, which makes up then your paintings of the different characters. And if you look at this, the data looks essentially like this. You can have simple Python scripts, you know, sh showing you how that works. And the initial answer that is already given by MNIST, but what you have usually as a question for you as an AI researcher would be how much training set, how much testing set, uh, in a way to report good results, it would be always good to have a good testing set, but statistical learning theory also wants a large training set. So in a way, you're already a little bit, you know, in contracts where to put the line. So it's basically uh, not a clear definition where to separate the training from the test set. There are some rules of sum. And of course, if you swim in data, then do 10% training, do a couple of validation sets, and then also do a 90% testing sets or something like this, or 80% testing set. So, but mostly what we have, especially in our world of rays and of our HPC simulation sciences, is often that we don't really swim in data, especially not in, let's say, this kind of annotated data or labeled data. Now, the interesting thing is that um, we, we talk about training and test set all the time, but when you have a proper machine learning tutorial like ones I gave in praise or basically what I have in the university, you have to think about validation and the bias introduced by picking, let's say, a model parameter. We call that an optimistic bias and it is in the data set explicitly included. So in a way it's contaminated if you want. So you have to throw it usually whenever you do a kind of decision in the model selection. That's why in normal scenarios, you also should break the training set a little bit into validation sets if you can, or perform something we call cross-validation, which would be now a bit more an elaborate topic to go for. But you see, when we now continue a little bit with our um, live demonstration here, um, we do nothing else than importing the data set, for instance. And here is a warning, which is not a big problem, but usually here you have already sometimes a problem that if you didn't download the data set before and you're not on the login node, then the chances are that the compute nodes are not allowing the download. So often these scripts need to be executed on the front end nodes, like we are now on, um, and then just execute this part to download the data set and through the file system, then the compute nodes can actually then later on when you switch again to the compute nodes, 
access it. It's a little bit of workaround that works. It's not valid for all the systems, just, just those which basically have no outgoing connections from the compute nodes, just as a side remark. Um, here we see now basically the training and the test data set have been already downloaded. As I said earlier, it's nicely part of the Torch Vision data sets already because it's a kind of de facto standard benchmark um, data set. Then you basically can here plot the data a little bit. It's always called data exploration. You want to understand a little bit the data. Something similar we had uh, essentially already on the slides, right? When you had the idea with um, what the characters may look like. Um, then there are some transform elements to, to put them more into a tensor form, uh, which is something to prepare the data. We call in the CRISPR-M model and other areas of AI often this data preparation set. And from there now, we basically said here in the slide, we don't only want to have the training data set and the test data set, we also want a validation data set. And this is randomly split here. You see around 55,000 images and 5,000 images uh, along the data set, um, basically creating for us a, a validation data set to perform in a sense model selection and the validation loss evaluation at the end, which is not so much introduced from the bias. But this would really require two or three more university lectures, understanding the law of large numbers, Höfting's inequality, Vapnik Shabunenke's inequality, which is then, then the core essence of the statistical learning theory. But um, in the end, practically speaking, what we here also define is a batch size. This is a hyperparameter, uh, which is not at all clear. And interestingly enough, in the last, um, I think in the last seminar, if you have been part of it in distributed deep learning, you have seen that this is even a critical factor of having large batch sizes if you want to scale high. Um, but this is the topic that you can look up at this other seminar. Of course, we need it here as well. So the epochs break things into smaller batches iteratively. We will see that basically later on in the script. We use the data loaders from Torch um, nicely for basically doing then the, the batching, so to speak. And also then if needed the shuffling, although the shuffling should be often more posed to the training, um, the, the lady has to be put to the test here in the, in the, in the there are probably in the, some reason for it, but I'm not really 100% sure why, because more in the training, this randomness element might make more sense in the testing. But um, this is something where maybe the, the lady had done some experiments also, and this is maybe not the latest greatest. This is the original one I got from the website so that you can completely reproduce what we're doing here. Good, but let's come to our encoder. So now we, we basically have said um, the data is there. We have training, test sets, and validation data sets. Now, when we talk about the outer encoder and we want to have specific outer encoders, we unfortunately have to have some prerequisites in this context. So in a way, I'm talking about convolutional operations. I talk about the whole structure of a convolutional neural network, understanding that, of course, there are weights between all of this, although there's a weight sharing, which is active between the different layers. And the best thing to realize that in a very quick fashion, we found over many tutorials in the last couple of years was this visualization which is nicely provided here. So let me show you this. I have many teaching lectures today, so I have to pick the right thing. Yep, I think that's it. So in a way you see here the idea of a convolutional neural network. Um, you have different layers starting here with the input layer where we maybe want to draw this eight that we basically have seen. And this would be the input layer. And here you see already every now and then the connections to the different next layer, which is in many cases in deep learning now omitted. You never saw it really, but of course they are all there, like in the traditional artificial neural networks. There would be lots of different connections. However, the convolution neural network have something specific that they of course perform convolution operations and they do a sampling. Um, it could be max pooling for instance, or the strongest signal survives. Um, and of course, you can specify how big the kernel should be that moves over essentially the input to perform then now the convolution operation. I have some examples in the outer encoder uh, alongside, but because of the time here, we cannot really focus on a complete introduction to CNNs. Now, the beauty is that over time, you carve out these features. And in a way, these features are condensed representation already of what you basically have also in autoencoders. encoders. 
right? The difference is in CNNs, you would then for classification tasks, for instance, here um, put a basically fully connected net together with a softmax layer to put on probabilities that you see here of which class it might be, right? It's never 100% accurate usually. You see an eight could be differently painted, but of course um, you have maybe this here, this could be a little bit an eight and a little bit a six because obviously the six and the eight is somehow also in compiled in the zero. Here's happening a lot of magic. So deep neural networks is essentially not something where you just use the artificial neural networks that you had in the past in the fifties and the sixties and just put lots of lots of neurons deeper and deeper. Here we're talking about very specific layers um, which have actually some very interesting functionality to, to, to perform actions. And the autoencoders will make use of it and add something differently to the game. And that's what we will talk about now uh, basically from, from the, in the next couple of slides. So we have to shift a little bit now the view. So we say, okay, we wanted to switch a little bit from supervised learning that you have seen before. So we knew every basically inputs image has a label associated. This is a supervised setup you see here, but we move to the unsupervised setup. So we assume we just lost all the labels, right? So we didn't have a data management plan that was failing and somehow all our labels are gone. The data set is broken. What can we do? Now, the first thing is maybe it, it is, looks uh, pretty bad, but the good news is that actually autoencoders are one unsupervised learning technology or algorithm or model, or whatever you call it, that actually can deal with the situation. And it has essentially always this kind of structure. Now we go a little bit into more details here where we say it has some form of an encoder and a decoder structure uh, where you put in an input like our image and actually you squeeze more and more information condensed together to this very condensed interesting space, this Latin space or Latin code. And then you start the reconstruction process for instance of this image and you will see that essentially this was something which could be more or less a bit reconstructed. And of course the way how far it can be reconstructed is now uh, relates heavily uh, how long you train. And of course, to think about the loss function, the reconstruction error is something which gives you feedback. Now in the process of training, you train the encoder, you train also the decoder. And of course, with having then uh, basically then this kind of reconstruction error loss of the original input image, you have a yardstick where you can say your training gets better. And this is let's say self unsupervised, so to speak. Luckily, we have something in the image, of course, it is a pattern. So we can always find out that the seven is a seven, but this is of course now the idea how to train these auto encoders. And one specific form, as I said, is then of course, um, the idea of using convolutional auto encoders. That's why we have this, uh, basically this idea here in this small tutorial, this brief introduction really to use essentially those. Um, in a way you have here different, and this is just a, a rough explanation on the top, just to show you where we are. So it's not actually the direct one that you see in the source code. These are different sources. Not that you're confused because the dimensions might not fit here in the co convolutions and then the flattenings. But essentially what you see here is that we work on the decoder, uh, on the encoder model, right? So the first part of the um, encoder decoder structure. And the way how these convolution operations work that we discussed, like in the convolution neural networks, is to have a kernel. It goes over it with a specific stride uh, nicely in this uh, interesting uh, animated GIF. You see also some paddings sometimes that need to have place to fit to the kernel and to the data structure. And what you see is basically by using the kernel, you have a, let's say, more compressed idea um, in the next layer of the data and also specialized one, because then you would have, let's say different so-called feature maps. So you would go and create this multiple times. Hence you would have here, not just one coming out. You have of course, multiple, of course, instances of those again. And if you want to know much more details, you need to really look at the convolution neural network um, uh, tutorials. We have some on our webpage. Um, for instance, we did this a lot in praise and also the Ulrich Supercomputing Center many times, but also Helmholtz AI in uh, Ulrich is still giving lots of seminars around this topic. They're all based on very similar ideas on this convolution 2D 
as I said, the stride, the dimensions are important. Sometimes batch normalization is here used. Um, this is a technique usually to make a more stable um, representation of the neural networks and to make them a bit more faster um, through scaling and other aspects. The rectified linear unit is the activation function that is usually done. And basically then you would add with um, specific neural networks or convolution neural networks with some pooling layers with, to sample down and so forth. So here we have lots of different convolutional um, layers and the way how it then converges into the so-called latent space, if you remember or this bottleneck as it is called, we have to flatten it out to really make a, let's say more or less linear representation of this interesting encoded space, which is in many cases much, much smaller from the dimensionality. So what we do here in a way is dimensionality reduction um, in a principled way. And um, so you basically have then at the end something where lots of you know, your information is there, uh, which can be now used for different many purposes. And of course the APIs, um, you see here conf2d, batch norm2d and relos are all um, torch uh, API essentials that you can look up. Also the sequential I should mention, maybe I forgot. This is a way of adding layers consecutively uh, to create a network like this. So this is something where, of course, more material is also on the PyTorch website. Now, the interesting part is the, for the autoencoder, at least now, is this kind of decoder. So the decoder is sometimes related to something we call deconvolution. And, and this adds to some confusions because essentially when you go to the API now, you don't find a deconvolution layer. So the point is that mathematically you would just say it's a transposed convolutions, right? So convolution transpose, if you remember arrays and vectors, um, you know, vector transpose, column vector to row vector and so forth. So this is something which still, of course, incorporates the same ideas. So you would have the initial idea, as we discussed, of having this kind of convolutions, which you then implement this conf to do and rectified linear units as activation functions. As again, here as an example, it doesn't recompile the overview here exactly. And now what you need essentially to come out from this flattened Latin space again with all the encoded, um, let's say, um, space of information back and do this reconstruction process. And this reconstruction process actually then do the inverse of the convolutions again and again, having essentially the very similar structure like the encoder part but now uh, essentially doing the inverse. Hence the transpose comes into place where we say we do then this convolution transpose 2D. And the other elements of this of course then will remain, right? So um, you will see here a little bit how that looks like in practice. You would say um, it looks a little bit this reconstruction process once you do it with this auto and decode process. So with the deconvolutions here, you end up with some people would say blurred images here but in interesting ways you will also see now that that's not always very blurred and it has a kind of special meaning to it so let's talk briefly about the decoder then um, essentially i already was explaining that the slide before um, we're going now backwards um, essentially so let's do this also in the live demo a little bit here in the jupyter lab so we define the convolutional um, encoder part as we discussed and then the decoder part um, which you see here is then starting of course from the latent space which is then this linear encoding and getting you know to an unflattened status so here you basically get from a very long vector so to speak back to a more um, interesting multi-dimensional setup and then do of course the 2d setup back and do the sequential convolutions, but in transpose or inverse, still doing the rectified linear unit, the batch normalization and so forth. And then basically you have your decoder ready. And what's coming out then is of course now that what we see in, in pictures um, that you see here, the A should be reconstructed. Again, here's also just to show you that the process is very similar in the transpose conv convolution you see here. Um, when you take the blue part, for instance, zero times the input from all this kernel would end up into zero. But if you move to the upper right part and use a kernel, 
you see already that some signals will be strengthening. So one, one becomes one, two, two, uh, three, three, and basically will strengthen more and more here when you go step by step to these um, and add them up so that you end up with the, um, let's say, going the same way over the space um, with the kernel, but in, in this kind of transposed manner. Um, what else? Yeah, so I think understanding this Latin space is now something where I guess many of you realize it's it's essentially just a compressed version that comes out of many, many convolutional processes that has some drawbacks, you would say. Uh, one of it is it is known that basically in the bottleneck, of course, you cannot keep maybe all the information, just the essential information. You try to minimize data loss. So essentially, you see that here a little bit, the reconstructed images from inputs, you would say that this was not really working well, right? The four was a nine, suddenly the one is a three, the four here is the eight. But if you think about that, these are also maybe not the perfect input, you know, input images. We talked before that, rubbish in, rubbish out. Here's basically no chance for the autoencoder to get it right. Here on the right-hand side, however, you see some benefits. You see some uh, more advantages of the autoencoder, maybe perfectly, let's say, showing a bit more generalization to the problem at hand, right? You see a very awkward four with a kind of small um, part here, which looks strange, but the the basically smoothest version, if you want, is basically that this hook is much more smooth. You have the zero, which is completely connected um, and no gray area there. So it's pretty clean, right? It's still white substance. And then a smooth three, um, where basically the upper part is not too long. And then also much more curve two than this zigzag Z or so. So there are also some, of course, if there's good input or relatively good input, that it can really work. And now this is basically now all what is done basically by the training, right? So now we optimize against this loss that we can get from this original input image and we can look at it. Often the mean square error is just used like in this example here, uh, when you talk about defining a so-called loss function that we had in the beginning of the tutorial, right? The error measure we need to get the training down to understand that we're getting better. And you see that here very nicely, we use just a prepared mean square error loss for this. And the rest is actually quite relating to high performance computing. Here we're picking the optimizer, which means uh, that is something where a lot of time is spent for the, the learning in the optimization. But also here we see that the device is checked. So which devices are available? So of course, when we do this here now on our funny front end, because somehow the back end was not working, with the GPU right now, I apologize. You will also see that um, essentially there will be no GPU found because we are still here on the uh, login node, but it's basically emergency backup that should still work. You see here selected device CPU because no CUDA device is on the login node. When you execute on a compute node, it will find the GPU and then the remaining training actually will be much more faster with the GPU. I'll just start this also a little bit here and then come back to the slides where we can define this just for the sake of um, we, because we essentially on the CPU, right? So that means our training, as you see, is quite slow, slow, but it doesn't work. You see, we basically get the error down. Um, let's explain that a bit. Uh, I have here also some supporting slides, but it's really the same we have in the code to give you really hands on. And of course, if you want to have your own problem, um, analyzed when you have some images, um, you can try and you know get away from the MNIST and put on your own images and try to adjust this code. Um, that's usually what I suggest also to my students. Don't start very much from scratch. You can use an existing script and basically uh, build on that. Here you see, for instance, that all the epochs and training, what is there, um, the, the definition of the different batches that needs to be in a for loop trained um, so to speak, is all already um, there. Important is also that you think about that we train the encoder and the decoder, right? That is something what some students always forget, that the decoder is also a neural network. We talk about two different neural networks combined in one. So you train both. Um, obviously, in the testing then, uh, you don't train anymore. You just take basically the, the different data sets. You will see that the optimizer has here usually no step. 
Um, that's where the learning and where the weight updates are taking space. Of course, obviously, this is missing in the testing epoch because the whole networks have been trained, the encoder and the decoder. Good, yeah, so otherwise, um, yeah, I think that's pretty explaining. Uh, we can show a little bit that this works. Uh, unfortunately, this is a bit slowly here, uh, probably in terms of the training steps because we just have CPUs. Obviously, GPUs are much better in this, um, but you also see after the first epoch, our uh, results are actually not very good. So we can still improve here somehow. And this is of course something what we can now wait for while I maybe explore a little bit what else you can do with auto encoders, how you can check and test them. In the sake of the time, I don't do too much on this. Um, there are different ways how you can validate what you're doing. We have the um, validation loss that you see here. It needs to follow suit on the training. Otherwise you, you maybe are in trouble. And this is working nicely here after 30 epochs. It also shows you that probably there's no more training necessary. We reach more or less a plateau. And, and with this adding now, let's say 30 more epochs will not much better the autoencoder. So there might be maybe other ideas like changing hyperparameters or the optimizer to gain more accuracy or, or, or let's say to minimize the error loss to be accurate. So this is a very important part. Interesting enough also for Rays, you can use the uh, samples in the, in the decoder as a basic for you know, having a generative model even. So you can generate new data sets, which might be interesting for Rays to have, let's say, uh, more data sets created where there's, let's say, not so many data sets around or where they are very costly to create them. So it's also interesting that autoencoders, I forgot about this part at the beginning, that basically you can use them partly as generative modeling. Um, here's basically a, a visualization of the encoded samples. Um, of course, this is mostly mathematical, but shows you also here and there the, the labels and different um, ways how to visualize this, uh, which is nicely also in this, um, you know, in the script at the end. And you see immediately that the autoencoder in this space performs clustering, obviously in a way indirectly to get the idea and the features really out in this latent space of what are all the digits. Now that it's still, let's say overlapping and so on, of course, is a matter of unsupervised learning, never is everything perfect in unsupervised learning, but you see already here that the, that the space has kind of separated this. And now when we tune this a little bit, with tasks at hand, and there's something called a principal component analysis, for instance, that you can do to carve out really the in most information content in all the different uh, feature vectors. And if you see that, um, basically, and you, you have much better representation already now, thinking about that this is 2D, right? So it's, it's relatively hard for this kind of uh, space to basically show that. But the PCA version here is already very good in showing that actually the autoencoder seems to work quite okay, still overlaps remain. And then there's another technique called the um, this distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, a more advanced one, which apparently has the best results here and there. We see, however, this extremely differences, but some of them can be explained if you think about that the three is sometimes like a two looking, if you're not really making the proper thing in the middle. So here you can really analyze a little bit why also these basically outer encoders may have you know, done something wrong. Good, but yeah, in a way that's really the most I wanted to say um, today for the convolution part, uh, just some application use cases because we talked before about this anomaly detection obviously is a very big one. When you train now on all these nice digits and you would say you have a complete different set of images, uh, you see that there's lots of cr trash again coming out where here is the error rate. And the error rate really gives you a very good indicator that this is probably not an image from this set. So in a way, if you have production and 3D printing as an example with images, and you have some specific error that you can use as threshold, here an example of 0 0.4, you would say that's a number, but these are all not numbers. So obviously you can really quickly go to something like anomaly detection, outlier detection is very si similar in the sense as well. Denoising the data is, is another application area of autoencoders. Um, you basically train and use a clean data set and then noisy input data you can create with white and black pixels. Some call it salt and pepper noise. Uh, 
which are actually then these interesting things you have here in the middle and so on. And what really works is interestingly enough that um, the, uh, the, the, if you put then this, this kind of noisy image through it, you see that the reconstruction process is then actually gets a filtered version out of it. And that's quite nice. However, in practice also it often entails that the Latin space needs to be bigger. This is something to do with the denoising effects, but otherwise you can use the autoencoder for that. But what I found most useful for Ray's um, saying is probably the pre-training for transfer learning, which works like this. Um, and you see here that we use essentially lots of these um, unlabeled um, parts where we basically have only small parts in labeled data, where, but we have maybe more data for unlabeled. We just use it as we have discussed today. So train it, make it work, use the error loss, your feedback, back propagate, and again, train the encoder and decoder. And once you're basically done with that, with the unlabeled data, right, then you shift now to the labeled data. But in order to do so, you can basically remove the second part. So the decoder, the reconstruction process is not needed because you have a clear label at hand. So where you can then put a fully connected softmax um, then to it and which you get the probabilities right. And then of course, when you have done this architecture, you retrain with a whole labeled data set, right? This is a technique we call transfer learning. Transfer learning because you took the initial weights that you have learned here, right? So now this green fellow is loaded. It has all the good learned weights from this unsupervised learning setup. And now you perform supervised learning here. And it, it's called semi-supervised because you combine both. And this is a step where you do transfer learning. You're reusing this and do another learning task now on the labeling. And this has incredibly often perfectly used, uh, useful in practice um, for different areas, not only of course in engineering like in race. Good, so um, I think in the light of the time, um, this autoencoder video is something what I would like to recommend to view. I just briefly show that very, very quickly because it shows you also how add to encoder are used, but the video, the complete one is essentially um, available on YouTube and there's a nice paper around it. I was mentioning it in many of our use case discussions. Just wanted to show you one interesting thing I found interesting as a machine learner, because you see that the network is generalizing to forms with this interesting thing that it has never seen before. And this in a way shows that that really the artificial intelligence inherently works, right? You see here water goes into water and autoencoders are used part of the process. Obviously it's not the whole process. There are long short term memory models as well that are used in combination with this, but it already let's say represents a quite interesting, um, let's say water flow as you see here, but they also had smoke in the paper. Right, so I think Let's have a final view on the Jupyter Notebook. Let's see if we advanced. Obviously, we are having not so many epochs done less with a GPU, but um, at least you see that the results are coming better alongside here. We, the output of the reconstructed images getting better and better. Um, and of course, now when we switch to the slides, how it would look like after 30 epochs, we just come back to this. We have then essentially, uh, where is it? We have then really good um, representations or reconstructs at the end. This is basically the results that would happen after 30 epochs. Um, so this is something we cannot wait for now, but um, you basically have the script freely available. I encourage you to reproduce it, maybe change your own images if you want um, to really learn more about autoencoders. And I think now is the time that I would close here just saying that all the references that I have used are basically here available. And yeah, also references to my team that work hell a lot behind the scene, all my PhD students and uh, Gabriel, my postdoc here to really make the clusters right. And all the different slides that you see and there are also with their content and materials from use cases. So thank you very much um, for listening to the autoencoders. I hope it is actually getting now to, to a degree that you understand them better. But I think now the real highlight is when you hear um, essentially Rakesh talking about the practicalities really
using also different forms of them, like variational autoencoders, which put a Bayesian school around this with priors, so much more complicated materials. Good, I see Rakesh is already ready to, to go, I guess. Um, yeah, yes. Rakesh, take uh, it from here. Yeah, Thank you very much. I see the so screen I and I can hear you very well. Okay. Is it, uh, is it visible now, the screen? Yes, full screen okay. is visible, perfect. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah, uh, thank you, Maurice, for the uh, introduction um, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so as Maurice said, I'm going to talk about some of the experiences uh, that I had with autoencoders, uh, uh, specifically with respect to uh, variational autoencoders uh, and physics uh, embedding. Uh, so how to actually embed some physical knowledge that we have, for example, into the network itself. Um, um, so uh, yeah, after Morris's talk, I think uh, this would be more into the theoretical part. So I think it was an, it was nice to already look into the structure of autoencoders, how they actually function. Um, and the, the my talk would be more into the, uh, let's say the theoretical part of mostly variational autoencoders and in the end uh, on the physics informed thing. Um, so to, to give a brief outline of my talk here. So initially I would be giving a very short introduction into the different architectures uh, that are possible in autoencoders. Um, so this is especially, I found a few architectures which are uh, kind of uh, more uh, relevant or more uh, useful for the use case that we have been working on the turbulent boundary layer. Uh, so that is a, a focus for me. Uh, so I would be talking about that. Um, uh, after that, uh, I would be giving an overview on variational inf inference. Uh, so actually, variational autoencoders derive their the theoretical background from the statistical field of variational infer inference. So I think it's important to understand like how uh, the the the, uh, the theoretical background uh, where it came from uh, basically so I would give giving an overview of, on the variational inference uh, and then we would be looking at the construction of the variational autoencoder itself and uh, there, there are also various types where in terms of the architecture how you can uh, design it um, and then uh, towards the end I would be talking uh, about physics embedded autoencoders so so this is derived from a recent paper that I have uh, uh, I got to know in the last one month. Uh, so I think they implement a very nice idea, which could be very useful for a lot of use cases in the race project. Uh, and then finally, I would conclude with some of my uh, recommendations, which I believe could be also useful for the other uh, use cases. Okay, so uh, to, to, uh, to, to start with, uh, so as I think Maurice has already uh, uh, given a very nice introduction on the vanilla autoencoder. So as, uh, this is one of the figures. So basically these are, as he said, unsupervised uh, deterministic networks. So deterministic is an important uh, word here for me because we are going to look at the variational autoencoders so, uh, which are actually probabilistic uh, networks. So that's the main distinction between the two. Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, Maurice has already gave a very nice introduction on the different uh, uses of uh, these of the autoencoders. Um, and then, uh, what is also interesting from this talk would be to looking to to, to look at the the uh, the architecture of the this code tensor itself. So this latent space, or the so-called code tensor, is typically flattened, as we saw in the example with the MNIST data dataset. Uh, but that is not something which uh, should necessarily be applied to all kinds of uh, fields. Uh, for example, uh, I think for turbulence data, at, at least which we have been using, uh, something uh, which was, was useful is to have a convolutional layer also for the code tensor. So instead of flattening out, we have these convolutional layers. So we would be looking at that. And then um, finally on this reconstruction itself. So the, the cost function as we saw for the MNIST data was basically this pixel wise difference between the original and reconstructed images. So the variational autoencoders uh, make a big distinction on this uh, reconstruction loss itself, similarly for physics encoded uh, autoencoders. Uh, so, so this is 
to give you an overview. So I think this, I don't need to explain much on this. So this is again, an example, uh, which is, which works on this MNIST data set. Uh, so we have this convolutional layers. And then finally, there is this uh, so-called fully connected layer where uh, this uh, convolutional uh, uh, filters are flattened out and we have this uh, fully connected layer at the end, which is compressed. Uh, uh, and it's, this, is, this is known as the latent, vec uh, latent vector or the code tensor. Uh, wh what you could instead do, instead of uh, doing the fully connected layers there, we could have this, uh, this code tensor also in a, in a block form. So for example, we don't flatten, flatten it out here. We just have this uh, also convolution layers defining this code tensor. Um, so that's, uh, that is what we would be exploiting uh, at some point during this talk. Uh, so having this kind of uh, representation for the code tensor. Um, of course, with this, uh, the, the normal or the vanilla autoencoder, uh, one, one of the issues is, of, if, is uh, uh, they're lacking the regularity. For example, if we compress this, uh, this code tensor very, uh, uh, very highly, then uh, there is always this issue of uh, lack of uh, interpretation, interpretability. So basically, if you want to have some, uh, let's say, physical interpretation, you are unable to have it because basically you don't have much information on it. Uh, and then uh, there is also no generative uh, capability. I would like to like uh, the 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 problem with uh, autoencoder not having generative capability is that uh, we can't uh, have unless we have this compressed representation, we cannot decode it back. So basically, uh, that is uh, something which variational autoencoders solve in in a, in a sense that they can be used also as generative networks to. Uh, do data augmentation, for example. So let's look into how the uh, variational autoencoders uh, look itself. Uh, so uh, they have this uh, also this encoding and decoding part as we uh, as we saw just now. Uh, the main distinction is, of course, this uh, middle part. So here we have now uh, instead of uh, one, uh, let's say one code tensor, we have two code tensors. So there is, uh, let's say, one code tensor which defines the mean. So it's uh, uh, one of the statistical uh, quantities defining the underlying probability distribution. So we might have the mean and the standard deviation. Uh, and then we have, since these are the uh, probabilistic quantities, we have uh, the Z or the compressive representation, which is, is, is a stochastic version now. So this is not, uh, not uh, deterministic anymore. Um, so so that this is of course, uh, in the stochastic sense, uh, you can be used as a generative network because you can generate samples here. So because uh, you have, you can, uh, be, this is a random variable in epsilon here, so you can generate new samples. So this can be used as a generative network. And uh, also, as we will see later, this X as a form of a regularization to the regular autoencoder that we have, uh, which we will see later. Uh, uh, so yeah, I already talked about this. Um, so the basic concepts of variational autoencoders, the theoretical uh, part, it, uh, it derives it from the variational, uh, from the theory of variational inference, which has been in, around in statistics for a long time. Uh, so the so the goal is to basically uh, we want to uh, approximate this underlying distribution of the latent uh, representation. So as as we saw in the last slide, we have this mu and epsilon, but mu and sigma, but these are unknown. So we want to uh, uh, approximate this, and uh, how this is done is using variational inference, where it's assumed that uh, this latent distribution follows a standard tractable distribution. So of, so. Since these are uh, quantities which could be, uh, which could follow any kind of distribution, right? So we need to do this assumption, and then we follow uh, an optimization part where we try to fit this underlying uh, distribution to a standard distribution that we know. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, the the distinction also is on the on the loss function itself. So now in the vanilla autoencoder, auto encoder, as we saw, we only have the reconstruction loss, uh, but now we also have the so-called latent loss, which is defined uh, 
based on the this uh, assumption of the distribution that we have. So to uh, to understand this, I think uh, it's better to have slightly uh, slight introduction to the variational inference theory of variational inference itself. Uh, so this comes from the inf information theory. Uh, basically, uh, see if we have an event, uh, we can quantify the information uh, contained in that event X using uh, this law, which is the negative uh, negative log of the probability of the event X. Now, if we want to, for example, uh, have like a mean, uh, let's say a mean information, or, uh, or let's say if we have a multitude of events, then we would need uh, entropy to uh, to find the mean of information. And uh, this is given here. So basically we take the expectation of this information and then uh, we have the summation which uh, averages out over the entire probability distribution P. Uh, now, why this is important is uh, this this entropy uh, entropy definition is used in order to uh, find uh, this so-called kullback leibler divergence. What uh, what the KL divergence does is basically it uh, finds the similarity between two probability distributions. So if we have P and Q, you can use this definition of entropy to find the difference between uh, the two. So the kullback leibler divergence basically would give you um, a measure, uh, basically, you know, in terms of a number uh, that how how these two distributions are uh, similar or dissimilar. And uh, it has a lot of uh, nice properties. Uh, so kullback leibler divergence is always uh, positive. Uh, for for example, if um, if both of these P and Q are similar, so if they are same, then we have a log of one, which is zero. So basically, you if KL is zero, you have uh, a similar distribution between P and Q. So, so in 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 as you can imagine, in the outer encoder case, we would uh, we would try to minimize it, right? So we since we are forcing two distributions to be similar. Uh, and then uh, they are also asymmetric, which is need to be careful about. Uh, they are also closely related to cross entropy. Uh, it works kind of opposite. So if you maximize uh, the KL divergence, you are actually minimizing uh, cross entropy. So it works on the opposite side. Uh, to give uh, to put it put this into the context of the autoencoder itself. So how do we relate this? Uh, so let's let's assume we have a mapping from a variable from uh, from variable z to variable x. Uh, so you could see that uh, z, let's say, is a hidden variable. So in this in the context of autoencoder, it could be the this code tensor that we have, right? The latent variable that we have, and uh, x is <clears throat> let's say an observation. So for example, it could be the data set that we have, right? So so since it's an observation, so that's the decoded part. So we need this connection, right? So because we have this decoding uh, part where we map this latent variable to the uh, to the observations, or at least we expect it to be close to the observations. Um, so since these quantities are probabilistic, now we need conditional probabilities. So uh, in order to find these conditional probabilities, we need Bayes rule. Uh, and Bayes rule, as uh, a lot of you probably already know, is gives a nice expression uh, to find conditional probabilities for uh, for uh, uh, this uh, this uh, uh, for related variables. Uh, the problem here is, of course, this this part here. So this this quantity, this marginal probability, is uh, is mostly intractable. So especially if if you have very high dimensional systems, uh, this this uh, this quantity is uh, uh, is mostly uh, uh, unable, like computationally computationally impossible to uh, compute. So this is of course a classical problem in statistics. Um, one can solve it with sampling methods. Uh, so for example, metropolis Hastings, we have some kind of proposal and then we do sampling and uh, yeah, we arrive at some kind of a posterior or we could use variational inference. So where, that's where variational inference comes in. So we uh, it helps us to find, let's say, intractable posteriors. How, how this is done? So basically we assume that there is uh, this, uh, this distribution that we are trying to find is given by a proposal. So we have a proposal Q. And this proposal is chosen from a family. 
from attractive value distribution, it could be a family of Gaussian. So if you have, um, it could be, for example, the multivariate normal distribution. And then during the optimization process, we uh, basically optimize these parameters of this of the tractable distribution. So for example, if you assume that it was a normal distribution, you try to uh, try to optimize the mean and standard deviation of the normal distribution and in order to arrive at that. Uh, and then we use uh, the KL divergence as we uh, just now saw. Uh, so because uh, KL divergence allows us to compare two probability distributions. So we have this Q and P's which, are, which need to be close to each other. Uh, so we use scale divergence here. Uh, the entire uh, uh, process, so there is a derivation here, which I don't go into. I mean, it's not within the scope of this, uh, uh, of this talk. So I don't go into the, uh, uh, the entire derivation here, but uh, finally, uh, when uh, you do all the math, you arrive at this objective function. Uh, and uh, here there are two parts. So one part is the scale divergence, of course. So we are trying to minimize this uh, uh, the 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 uh, difference between these two probability distributions. And then the other part is the variational is so-called variational lower bound. So this this uh, this term comes from the uh, variational inference uh, theory, basically. Uh, I won't go into the details here, but basically this is. Uh, an expectation operation, uh, which you will see here. So uh, in order to relate it to the autoencoder, uh, so this is the figure that we have been seeing in the last uh, hour and a half. Uh, so for the encoding uh, part, uh, this is the distribution we are uh, trying to uh, approximate. Uh, so this is our uh, proposal distribution. And then uh, Z, we assume that Z uh, has a certain uh, uh, criteria. So th there are there, Z obeys a certain distribution and then we try to match these two. So that's the uh, en uh, encoding part. And then the decoding part, since Z is already known, we can uh, propagate this to find our, uh, our output quantity. Uh, now, what is very interesting here is that this objective function itself has two parts. Uh, so the one part is scale divergence, as we already saw. So uh, the other part, uh, and this scale divergence, it basically minimizes right the difference between uh, divergence from the prior that we already have. So because it reduces the uh, loss between two probability distributions. And the other one is actually what it does is it maximizes the likelihood of observation. So if since we see these these quantities, it uh, it tries to um, maximize that. Okay, we see what we observe is actually uh, given by the probability distribution uh, by the propagation here, and this roughly translates to a reconstruction error. So if this quantity, if the if this distribution over here is given by a normal distribution. Uh, then uh, this is an example, of course, it, it could be another distribution, then this form would be slightly different. But if it's a Gaussian distribution, for example, then we arrive at uh, this uh, two norm kind of uh, uh, error. So uh, so this is quite neat, so, like in comparison to a, a vanilla or a plain autoencoder, you could have a direct analogy between the two. So you have the reconstruction part here and the, and the, uh, the uh, KL divergence part with which takes into effect, which takes into, uh, yeah, takes, takes control of the, this probability distribution itself. Yeah, uh, and uh, okay, so that's uh, the more or less the part how, how we arrive at this, this, this distribution, like the optimization part at least. But uh, one, there is of course one problem here is in the sense that uh, this node here is, since it's a probabilistic network, it's not uh, not uh, uh, not a singular number, right? So it's not one number, but uh, uh, but a couple of uh, so it's a random random node here. So basically, the yellow color here signifies a random node. Uh, but there is this so-called reparameterization uh, trick, uh, which is employed. Uh, so what is done here is basically you force the network to learn the mean and standard deviation over in, in this uh, part. And then you add the randomness through uh, 
uh, through this epsilon operator. So the epsilon is basically a random variable which you multiply with the sigma. And then uh, it, it randomizes the, the entire thing, but it uh, enables us to do, for example, back propagation uh, through the network because you would need to back propagate your uh, gradients through the entire network. So that's a, uh, like a neat technique to, uh, to take care of the stochasticity while still being able to uh, back propagate uh, your results. Uh, so there are other versions of uh, autoencoder. Uh, I think I'm already running out of time, so uh, I would quickly go through uh, this uh, this part. Uh, so basically, uh, what I found was very very useful. At least if you use if you are going to use variational autoencoder, at some point is also to explore <coughs> that so-called disentangle uh, variational autoencoder. Uh, in this case, what happens is. Uh, uh, there is like this weight factor, weighing factor uh, given by this parameter beta here. Uh, so the scale divergence uh, term is weighed uh, with this beta term. So as you can imagine, if the if the if the beta is very low, then you would weigh this term higher, and then this is this corresponds to the reconstruction error. So for a low beta, you would essentially end up with a vanilla autoencoder. But if if this is very high, then uh, you would have higher reconstruction error, but then you would have a more regularized network uh, uh, since this uh, KL divergence adds regularization to the to the network. Um, and there are also other uh, few other variations which I found very very useful for the turbulent use case that we have. Um, and this is uh, pertaining to the how these uh, latent uh, the these these latent filters are handled. Uh, this actually was already. Uh, quite a long time back in 2017 in uh, master thesis, uh, which I found. Uh, so what is done here is uh, these latent filters are treated uh, slightly differently. Uh, so instead of uh, um, uh, to arrive at, let's say this uh, random variable uh, Z, they, uh, so one of the ways to do that is to flatten. So because you have a convolutional uh, code tensor representation now, uh, one needs to flatten it out in order to arrive at uh, uh, a probability distribution in order to compare in order to compare it with the underlying distribution. So one way to is uh, to do that is to flatten out all the dimensions and arrive at this uh, kind of form uh, without taking into care of uh, anything in within this uh, without taking into care the dimension of the uh, of the filters itself. Uh, so that is, that is called neuron level. The other is called a naive filter level redundancy, redundancy reduction. What here, what is done here is actually these uh, these things are averaged. So basically, uh, all of these filters are averaged, and then you arrive a as a so this z uh, hat would now be a representation of these individual filters. Why I mentioned this here is I found that this could be very useful for uh, for increasing the accuracy of uh, of the variational autoencoder, so I, I think that's something which could, uh, which uh, the users might benefit from. Okay, so uh, so the next part of my talk would be on the on the physical constraint uh, itself. Uh, so uh, this has already been uh, around, uh, like making uh, making the neural networks dependent on, let's say, the underlying uh, uh, physical equations. Uh, so that that was. Uh, especially being popularized after the spins idea, uh, which came up in uh, came out in 2019, where the underlying uh, PD is included in the cost function itself in the form of this residual term. Um, is this of course exploits this automatic differentiation tool because um, in in a, in, a, in a typical typical setting, for example, if you are trying to find uh, the uh, the behavior of the flow field, for example, you would have the uh, the coordinate system as an input, so the x, y, z uh, as input, and then you would have the flow field, for example, for example, the velocity flow field as output, and then you have this uh, neural network uh, mapping this to these two uh, uh, spaces. Uh, so then, the, in in that kind of a setting, the automatic differentiation tool is, of course, very uh, natural way to compute the derivatives. But in, uh, in outdoor encoders, that is not always possible because uh, basically, if you are trying to reconstruct a certain field, you 
you have the same as input and the target. So they are same. And then the gradients would go back to the same field, basically. So you cannot compute the gradients with respect to, uh, let's say, space or time. So yeah, we need other ideas to uh, include physical constraints. Uh, sorry for the typo here. Uh, uh, one is, of course, using regularization itself. So that is uh, more classical using, so making the autoencoder sparse uh, using L1, L2 regularization, for example. Uh, and then uh, one could also inherit ideas from uh, PCA uh, with principal component analysis. So where the, the basis vectors are uh, forced to be uh, orthogonal, for example. So we could have those kind of properties. Um, and and then there are other concepts uh, where uh, you actually have the physical equations directly in the reconstruction. So in the net, in the network or the loss function. So you could roughly divide this into into uh, uh, two uh, two categories. One is uh, so this Raisi idea, which is the pins that we saw, could be called soft constraint. So that is the one where you penalize the loss function itself. And the other that we would be uh, looking at now is uh, with this hard constraint. Uh, so uh, by hard constraint, uh, uh, it, 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 is, uh, uh, it means that you are trying to constrain the network, uh, trying to put this physical constraint within the network itself. So it's part of the uh, neural network. Uh, so this is a very interesting approach. Actually, I saw uh, from this uh, paper, which came out very recently in 2020. Um, and uh, what, uh, so this, uh, this is also a, a paper which does, uh, uh, so the work is applied for a, for a high fidelity turbulence data for finding compressible velocity fields. So basically they try to exploit the incompressibility. So put this incompressibility condition uh, in the network. So they force the network to learn the uh, latent representation which satisfies the divergence free condition. Uh, in order to do that, uh, uh, they exploit the so-called potential formulation, which is based on the Helmholtz decomposition. So this, the velocity field, you could write it in this form of uh, uh, based on the velocity potential and the scalar potential. For the particular case in this paper, uh, the, they had steady and periodic boundary conditions. So this scalar potential could be put to zero. Uh, which gives uh, them uh, an expression where the velocity field is equal to the curl of the uh, velocity potential, basically. Now, um, uh, so if if if, uh, if if this holds, then the divergence free condition is automatically satisfied because if you take the divergence here, then you get this expression which is equal to zero. So if you are able to ensure that you have, if you are able to find the field A uh, and take the curl of that field and put that equal to the, uh, constrain that to be equal to the velocity field, then you are satisfying the divergence free condition. That's what they do. Um, so on the top is the unconstrained network. So you have the input and the output velocity field. Uh, so the encoding and decoding part. Uh, this is of course the unconstrained uh, network. Uh, in the constrained case, what they do is uh, for the final layer of this decoding, uh, decoding, uh, final layer of the decoder network they they put this as this uh, as the velocity potential uh, actually and then they apply uh, the derivatives there uh, uh, and uh, finally take a curl and uh, once you take the curl you have the uh, velocity field itself and then you put that into the loss function so that yeah, these two match so that's that's a very nice way to actually embed the physics uh, into the uh, into the network itself. But what is uh, even more interesting is how, how they actually compute uh, these derivatives itself. Um, so this is a concept which has been there around from around, I think uh, 2017 this from what I saw, I don't know if there are also papers from even older times. Uh, so there is an analogy which is drawn here between uh, uh, the, the derivatives, ah, sorry about the, Typo again. Uh, anyway, uh, so the, the analogy is basically between the uh, the CNN kernels and the numerical stencils. So they, so if so if you have a one step striding, striding then uh, the CNN kernels that Morris uh, showed very nicely could be equated to the 
for example, the finite volume or finite difference uh, stencils that we have in the numerical methods. Um, and then there is an example here. So for example, if we, if you want to, for example, have uh, a central difference scheme for finding the uh, first order derivative uh, up to a second order of accuracy, you could have a kernel of this kind. Of course, the kernel here is fixed. So these weights are not trained. So that's part of the no untrained or uh, fixed uh, layer of the network. Uh, so you run this convolution through this, uh, through the velocity potential and you are able to compute the derivatives. Uh, and you could actually change the, uh, the accuracy. For example, if we want to have a higher order accuracy, uh, basically we would have more terms here, right? So we would have, for example, five terms, then we would need for example, five by five kernels. Uh, of course, handling the boundary condition is 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 not uh, straightforward here. So that is uh, something, yeah, you need to also look at. I think these these references are very useful for that. So I would really encourage you to uh, look into these papers if this is interesting for you. Um, so yeah, so that brings me to the to my final slide. So. Basically, uh, uh, there are many, uh, many developments that are going on and uh, which are worth to explore. Uh, and uh, especially with this physics constraint uh, networks that, that they are growing at quite fast pace, I, I would say. Uh, so few recommendations from my side, uh, um, I'm sure this is not, uh, not the case for all the use cases uh, in the race project perhaps. But uh, at least for the turbulent uh, data, uh, I, 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 uh, my experience was that the fully convolutional rather than fully connected latent representation uh, seemed to give a higher accuracy for, the, uh, for reconstructing at least these fine uh, secondary flow features that we have. Uh, and then uh, also if you use uh, variational autoencoders as I already mentioned, Disentangle variation autoencoders uh, seem to give more stability to the to the training process, uh, especially at the initial training phase. I think uh, I, for for us uh, a lower weight to the date and loss term was essential in order. Otherwise, uh, we saw that the network sort of diverged, mm -hmm. and then also the learning rate is of course a very important hyperparameter in all kinds of uh, neural networks. Um, regarding the physical constraint itself, uh, the example that I showed is of course limited to, a, to an incompressible fluid flow case. So that is a very problem specific. So I think in order to find something which works for us, we need to explore more, explore more into the physics itself of the respective field. Okay, yeah, with that, I would like to end my talk and open the floor for discussion. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we are quite far in the time, but maybe we have, you know, time for one or two questions before I quickly close. Anyone from the audience that maybe have a question um, right now for autoencoders, use, use and race, variational autoencoders? It's a large topic, so we might not be able to answer everything. <laughs> but yes, please go ahead. Going once. Twice. Yeah, there's a question from Andreas. Please go ahead. Hi, Rakesh. Thank you very uh, for the very good talk. I have a short question concerning uh, the derivative uh, computation. Um, as I understood, the delta x in the in the computation is fixed, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, what would happen if you have um, meshes with uh, different delta x's? You could do that, like uh, so. Basically, the like for also for us, we had different delta x. So basically, in the uh, the wall normal direction, uh, the uh, the at least the implementation that we had, we had like these three layers, and the lowest, uh, the first layer had the lower thickness, basically. So uh, so as as I showed this kernel, uh, you have, you could change the delta x for this difference. So different, uh, let's say. Uh, 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 so, so these kernels would basically work on different layers. So if you have three layers, uh, the first dimension would work at the first layer, then the last dimension would work at the highest layer. So you could change delta x depending on which layer the kernel is acting on. Uh, 
so in this particular example, of course, I said that everything is uh, delta x, but you could have delta x1, delta x2, and then, uh, for example, you need to add for sometimes delta x1 plus. So yeah, those things can be arranged. So uh, basically, it depends on how you design the kernel. So you can make the kernels such that, in a way, it matches however you do the numerical underlying numerical analysis. Okay, thank you. But that also means that the uh, delta x per layer is then fixed. So you cannot have any changes over time, right? Yeah, okay, yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah, over yeah, time, okay. you cannot change it. But yeah, um, okay. yeah I, I mean, um, uh, in a way, you could also make this as a training hyperparameter. I mean, okay, that goes, I think, maybe to beyond. But <laughs> uh, like, if you want to uh, do it in a predictive or a predictive uh, uh, flow case and then you have new mesh then i think yeah then i think things become complicated but yeah maybe i should not go into the territory but yeah uh, at least for now i think it has to be fixed compare like it has to be it has to correspond to the training yeah. okay thank you yeah all right yeah i think also the auto encoders will be with us i'm very sure the next year so we, please feel free, everyone joining, um, actually to contact us. I mean, Rakesh, as you have seen, is quite an expert now in the field. But also, in generally, for autoencoders, I'm sure that many other use cases will also dive into this topic, even if it's just for working with the data. Finally, I just want to thank, actually, Rakesh for presenting here with me um, after directly after the vacation period. And also, thanks to every one of you for joining. As usual, a small appetizer, what is coming and where you get more information. Um, the RACE website, obviously, is a good source for information um, for, for everything around RACE. We are working on this unique AI framework, as I introduced, and there also we would like to collaborate, of course, with people outside of the project. So if you are not really in RACE, uh, please also work with us if you want. In here and there are some use cases. Testing, for instance, scalability of some frameworks would be very relevant. And then basically this YouTube channel is of course something which uh, this series here is basically filling every month. So you will see there are more and more seminars probably coming alongside the YouTube channel. So please feel free to, to look at this and also consider please subscribing to it. As a EU project, we also basically are judged of how many subscribers are really there and how many people really looking at the material we put there. So also this seminar that we have today, of course, will end up in this YouTube channel in some time. And just give you a sneak preview of what we expect to have in September. We're planning to have a much more hardware-oriented one in terms of seminars this time, um, basically based on graph core. It's an idea to have a really, let's say, intelligence or artificial intelligence processing unit. They call it IPU, and that is basically having the whole machine learning models inside the processor. So more, let's say, different angle than we had usually in the seminars, but equally interesting. The date and time will be announced of this, and Atos will be co-organizing this with us. And surely, as we do lots of AI, um, this will have in one way or another also really relevance for us, because we use accelerators for AI and machine learning a lot in the project, specifically scaling to exascale, of course. So again, I think, thank you very much for everyone. And yeah, see you in September in the seminar.